Today, I'll be discussing the QT interval and the long QT syndrome. It may be surprising to students who are just starting to learn about EKGs that the QT interval would be an advanced topic, but there are a surprisingly high number of nuances to its measurement and interpretation. After the video, you should be able to describe the electrophysiological significance of the QT interval, accurately measure the QT interval and correct for heart rate, describe how the QT interval is measured when the QRS complex is unusually wide or when the RR interval is irregular, list etiologies of prolonged QT, both congenital and acquired, and to describe and identify the potentially fatal arrhythmia, torsade de pointe. First, what is the QT interval physiologically? The QT interval represents the time delay between depolarization and repolarization for all of the ventricular myocardium. Here is an action potential for a typical single myocardial cell. Now don't tune out. I'm just going to spend a minute on this, but it's important to understanding a couple of things later on. The action potential is divided into five phases. It actually starts at phase four, which is the cell's so-called resting potential, when the electrical potential of the interior of the cell is negative. When a wave of depolarization hits the cell, phase zero is triggered. The electrical potential very rapidly rises, which is equivalent to saying the cell depolarizes, and this is due to inward sodium current across the cell membrane. Next is a small decline and sometimes a small notch, which is referred to as initial repolarization, this is predominantly caused by outward potassium current. Then there is a plateau phase, or phase 2, which occurs when inward calcium flow balances outward potassium flow. And finally, there is complete repolarization back to the resting potential due to continuation of outward potassium current, which is no longer counterbalanced by calcium. The QT interval represents the time between phase 0 and the end of phase 3, as averaged across all of the ventricular myocardium. Since this time period is determined by the balance between potassium and calcium currents during the plateau phase, it's easy to see why abnormalities of the QT interval are often associated with either hereditary defects in potassium or calcium channels, drugs which impair those channels, specifically potassium channels, or with serum levels of those ions. On the EKG, how does one measure the QT interval? There are multiple different methods advocated for its measurement. You likely already know, as the QT interval represents the time delay between ventricular depolarization and repolarization, it is measured from the beginning of the QRS complex to the end of the T wave. Surprisingly, that's not the only method that's out there, but it is by far the most common. So for example, in this case, the QT interval appears to be just two large boxes or 400 milliseconds. That probably seems quite easy. However, there is a fair amount of subjectivity involved, particularly with low amplitude T waves, in the presence of atrial fibrillation or atrial flutter, which can obscure T waves, or in the presence of signal artifact. Accurately measuring the QT interval in either of the bottom two example strips is impossible. Next, what is the normal range of the QT interval? You've likely heard the quick shorthand version, which says that the QT interval should be half the RR interval or less. In this case, the RR interval is 980 milliseconds, so this QT interval is not prolonged. Although this rule of thumb is frequently taught, it's very problematic because most people either forget or were never told that it only works at normal heart rates. Instead, the QT interval should be adjusted for heart rate as faster heart rates result in a QT interval which is shorter, but not as relatively shortened as the RR interval. So at tachycardic rates, the QT will appear prolonged. The opposite holds true for bradycardias, in which the QT interval does not lengthen in proportion to the RR interval. Unfortunately, no one knows what correction formula best accounts for this effect. By a large margin, the most commonly employed equation is Bezet's formula, which states that the QT corrected, or QTC, equals the QT interval divided by the square root of the RR interval as measured in seconds. What Bezet's formula does is to essentially give a rough prediction of what the QT interval for the patient would be if his or her heart rate could magically be reset at 60 beats per minute. 
Let's take a look at two examples. In this example, a patient is very bradycardic with a heart rate of 44 and an RR interval of 1370 milliseconds. The QT interval is measured at 600 milliseconds. 600 milliseconds is much less than half of 1370, so one might initially say that the QT interval is normal. However, if you plug in the RR and QT intervals into Bazet's formula, you find that the QTC is actually 512 milliseconds. As we'll see in a minute, this is prolonged even though it eyeballs roughly okay to most novices. On the other hand, in this tachycardic patient with a heart rate of 128 and an RR interval of 470 milliseconds, the QT interval of 300 initially looks too long, but plugging the numbers into Bazet results in a QTC of 438, which is normal. There are several other equations that are used to correct the QT interval for heart rate, all of which are thought to be modestly more accurate than Bazet's formula. However, Bazet's is far and away the most commonly used, and unless you intend to become an electrophysiologist, you will not need to know about these alternative approaches. So now, what is the normal range for the QT interval, or more accurately, the QTC? It's mildly dependent upon age and gender. Prior to puberty, both males and females have the same normal range. While after puberty, males tend to have slightly shorter QTC intervals than females, which is attributed to differences in the ratio of sex hormones. There is not a complete consensus on the normal range of the QTC. However, as an approximate average of varied reported normal ranges in adults, a QTC under 440 is considered normal in both genders. A QTC of 440 to 450 is borderline in men, and one of 440 to 460 is borderline in women. There is also an important difference between having prolongation of the QT interval and having a clinically relevant prolongation of the QT interval. For example, a QTC of 470 is technically abnormal in all genders and ages, but I doubt it would raise any red flags with the overwhelming majority of internists and cardiologists, except to make them pause before prescribing drugs whose side effects include QT prolongation. However, a QTC above 500 is generally considered to be clinically relevant in all patients and in all situations. The significance of QT prolongation of lesser degrees depends upon the presence of QT prolonging drugs and risk factors for fatal arrhythmias which we'll discuss in a few minutes. In addition to the adjustment of the QT interval to account for the heart rate, there are several other additional debated questions about its measurement. For example, in which lead should the QT be measured? How should the QT be measured and corrected in irregular rhythms? Should a prominent U wave be included in the QT measurement? And last, how should the QT be measured and interpreted when the QRS itself is unusually wide? Let's discuss these one at a time. Which lead should be used when measuring the QT? Guess what? There is no standard approach, though proposed standards include lead 2, any limb lead, the lead with the most easily discernible QT interval, and the lead with the longest QT interval. What about measuring the QT interval when the rhythm is irregular, since the QT is dependent upon the preceding RR interval? In this case, there are two approaches discussed in the literature. The first is to measure and calculate the QTC for 10 successive beats using the RR interval immediately before the associated QT interval and averaging them. This is unreasonably time consuming for typical clinical practice. In the second approach, one measures and calculates the QTC for the QT intervals immediately following the longest and shortest RR intervals on the EKG. So for this example, this is the longest RR interval on the strip at 680 milliseconds and its associated QT interval of 380. This gives a QTC of 460 using Bazet's formula. The shortest RR interval is 470 and its associated QT interval is 340 for a QTC of 496. Averaging these together, we get an overall QTC of 478. Next, how should the U wave impact QT measurement? If the U wave is distinct from the T wave and much smaller in size, most cardiologists do not include it in the measurement of the QT interval. 
However, some cardiologists will include it if the U wave amplitude is greater than 50% that of the T wave, but it's not known if this is appropriate. It's important to not confuse a small U wave with unusual T wave morphologies that are seen in some subtypes of congenital long QT syndrome. The final special situation is how to measure the QT interval when the QRS complex is unusually wide. This is an important question because a wide QRS complex will lead to an increase in the QT interval that is not clinically relevant. Electrophysiologists often use something called the JT interval, or the JT corrected, to account for this, where the JTC is calculated in an analogous way as the QTC. Remember that the J point is the location where the QRS complex ends and the ST segment begins. A JTC above 330 milliseconds is considered abnormal and of the same consequence as prolongation of the QTC. So now why do we care so much about an accurate measurement of the QT interval? Why is it so much more important than an accurate measurement of the other intervals on the EKG? It's because of a potentially fatal condition called Long QT syndrome. Long QT syndrome is just a name given to any disorder or situation which leads to a long QT interval. Etiologies of long QT syndrome are divided into congenital, that is hereditary, and acquired, which are usually medications or metabolic derangements. However, this dichotomy may be artificial since many patients with acquired long QT syndrome who have associated life-threatening arrhythmias likely also carry a genetic predisposition. As you may already know, that life-threatening arrhythmia associated with a prolonged QT interval has the unusual name of torsade de pointe, which is French for twisting of the points. It's commonly shortened to just torsade. The characteristics of torsade are that it's a polymorphic VT, the QRS morphology and axis goes through cyclical alterations, it is universally associated with a prolonged QT interval, and it is classically triggered by a preceding so-called long-short pattern. In this example, here is an unusually long RR interval, followed by a short one, and this is the QRS complex or ventricular depolarization which triggers the arrhythmia. The mechanism of torsade is early after depolarizations. If you'd like to learn more about what those are, check out my video on mechanisms of arrhythmias. Regarding the clinical significance of torsade, episodes usually terminate spontaneously, often after causing syncope, though they can also lead to sudden cardiac death. In addition to QT prolongation, which is essential for developing this arrhythmia, risk factors include female gender, hypokalemia, hypomagnesemia, heart failure, recent conversion from atrial fibrillation, rapid IV infusion of a QT prolonging drug, and any situation in which bradycardia occurs in combination with certain QT prolonging drugs. This is because some QT prolonging drugs, such as sodalol, exhibit a property called reverse use dependence, in which they have a greater effect at slower heart rates. I'm going to spend most of the remaining video discussing the etiologies of a prolonged QT interval. First, there is congenital long QT syndrome, which is a group of mostly related genetic disorders involving cardiac ion channels, next medications, electrolyte disorders, and a collection of miscellaneous problems including hypothyroidism, hypothermia, myocardial ischemia, and starvation. Although diagnosing congenital long QT syndrome would seem obvious, it can be more tricky than you might guess on account of there existing an overlap in the range of QTCs of affected patients and those QTCs of normal individuals. There are two clinical phenotypes, the Romano Ward syndrome, which is long QT without deafness, and the Gervell and Lang Nielsen syndrome, which is long QT associated with deafness. In practice, almost no one uses the term Romano Ward, and instead stating that a patient has congenital long QT syndrome implies that it's the Romano Ward phenotype. There are at least 13 distinct genotypes, which are designated LQT types 1 to 13. Most of these genotypes are a loss of function mutation in one of several cardiac potassium channels. LQT1, 
LQT2 and LQT3 account for most cases. The inherited neurodevelopmental disorder Rett syndrome is also associated with a prolonged QT interval. However, the effective protein of Rett syndrome is not an ion channel, and the explanation for the association is not well understood, though it is believed to be generally due to abnormal autonomic regulation. Here are some of the details of LQT1 through 3, which I'm not going to read through individually. I will point out two interesting features of them, however. First, LQT3 does not affect the potassium channel, but rather a voltage-gated sodium channel that's the same protein that's defective in the Brugada syndrome, which is discussed in another video. Second, the most common trigger for Trasad is different in different genotypes. In LQT1, it's exercise. In LQT2, it's emotional stress. And in LQT3, it's sleep. There are also some very specific triggers that have been described in different genotypes. For example, swimming has been reported as a particular trigger in LQT1, and alarm clocks and other sudden unexpected noises have been described as a trigger specific for LQT2. Moving on from congenital long QT syndrome, medications are another important etiology. A huge number of meds have been implicated. However, absolute and comparative risks between implicated drugs within the same class are generally not known. While there are some studies that do compare the risk between different drugs, many of these are produced by drug companies and are not published by peer-reviewed journals. Also, they almost all look at the degree of QT prolongation rather than risk of torsade, which is the more relevant endpoint we should be concerned about. This is because some drugs have a much greater association with QT prolongation than with the development of torsade. Amiodarone, an antiarrhythmic, is the classic example of this. It very commonly causes QT prolongation, but is only uncommonly associated with torsade. When considering the relative risk of QT prolongation, to make things simple, you should just think about drugs in two or three broad categories of risk rather than trying to discern the relative ranking of different drugs within the same class. So here are some drugs that are typically considered to be high risk for QT prolongation and some that are moderate risk. Please be aware that this list is not comprehensive and should not be used as a reference during direct patient care. In the high risk category, we have the class three antiarrhythmics, which are the highest risk drugs of all. This is predictable given that they are all predominantly potassium channel blockers. So QT prolongation isn't a side effect, but rather an indication of their intended mechanism of action. These drugs include sodalol, ibutilide, dofetilide, and amiodarone, though as mentioned a second ago, amiodarone in particular appears to have a much lower risk of torsade than its QT prolonging effect would suggest. Other drugs in the high-risk category include class 1A antiarrhythmics such as kynodine and pocanamide. This is because these drugs, while predominantly sodium channel blockers, also have potassium channel blocking activity. The antipsychotics theoridazine and ziprazidone are generally considered the riskiest in that class, and there is a promotility agent called cisapride, which is not available in the U.S. Drugs with a more moderate risk of QT prolongation include all other antipsychotics, tricyclic antidepressants and SSRIs, quinolones and macrolides, most antiemetics, including ondansetron and metoclopramide, and the narcotic methadone. Moving on to electrolyte disorders, hypokalemia, hypomagnesemia, and hypocalcemia are all reported to be associated with long QT syndrome and torsade. However, the precise nature of the association with hypokalemia is unclear. Possible explanations include that hypokalemia truly prolongs the QT interval, Hypokalemia increases the risk of torsade when the QT interval has been increased from another cause, such as medications. Or hypokalemia's induction of prominent U waves makes the QT interval artificially seem long. Or it may be a combination of all three of these explanations. Hypomagnesemia's association may be a consequence of analogous indirect effects, including the fact that hypomagnesemia 
can induce hypokalemia. To be sure, almost all textbooks claim or imply that these three electrolyte abnormalities directly cause QT prolongation by themselves. And if you encounter a relevant question on a school or medical board exam, you should definitely answer the question with the assumption that they do. And certainly, if you encounter a patient with QT prolongation and deficiencies of any of these electrolytes, you should definitely replete them. But the exact pathophysiology at work here isn't entirely clear from the published evidence. I wanted to specifically show you an example of the QT prolongation caused by hypocalcemia since there is something unique about it. Unlike other causes of QT prolongation in which the QT is prolonged largely because the T wave itself is unusually prolonged, in hypocalcemia it's a prolonged ST segment that's the cause of the QT prolongation. The T wave itself looks completely normal. So if you ever see a patient with QT prolongation but normal looking T waves, check the serum calcium. I'm going to end this video with another prorhythmic condition, but one that most non-cardiologists have never heard of, short QT syndrome. This is a very rare recently described syndrome in which an unusually short QT interval, that is a QTC under 360, is associated with cardiac arrest and sudden cardiac death. Mutations in six different genes have been described in patients with short QT syndrome. Three are gain-of-function mutations in cardiac potassium channels, while three are loss-of-function mutations in cardiac calcium channels. Hypercalcemia is also associated with a short QT interval, though it's not clear if the short QT interval in this circumstance also predisposes to sudden cardiac death. Here's an example of short QT syndrome. The RR interval is 740 and QT is 280, which gives us a QTC of 325. That concludes this video on the QT interval and long QT syndrome. Be sure to like and share the video if you found it helpful, and check out our other EKG videos if you have not done so already.